And one last thing here, jumping on down to Columbia, where we got uh, my man J.C. Sherbert going to go on a deep dive on the South Carolina Gamecocks. But before we get to that interview, just wanted to make this note. He's made it official. Josh Van returning for another season. 43 catches, 668 yards, six touchdowns for the Gamecocks. He's their go-to receiver. And all of a sudden, receiver could be potentially a bright spot for the Gamecocks with uh, Jaheim Bell, Josh Van, Austin Stogner. They've got some nice pieces there. And that's something we touched on with J.C. Sherbert of the Big Spur. South Carolina fans, you're really going to like this one. All right, we're pleased to, uh, hey, once again, one of my favorite people out there in the SEC and all of college football, J.C. Sherbert, owner of the Big Spur, of course, part of the 24-7 Sports Network. He's the host of the Inside Gamecocks podcast and the J.C. and Morgan College Football Podcast with Mike Morgan, who calls games for ESPN. J.C., thanks so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Hey, no problem, Mike. I always look forward to spending time with you and uh, love the podcast and the work you guys do. I think uh, I listen to you guys about every day during the the summer of the pandemic in 2020, and (laughs) you guys kept my spirits up about uh, there actually being a season, and lo and behold, there was. Yeah, I mean, those were the dark, dark times of uh, college. So, man, I'm just so glad that, uh, you know, we were able to put that behind us, and, and, you know, it threatened bowl season there for a minute, but Man, I'm, am I glad the Gamecocks took the field because, man, did they put a whooping on North Carolina in the Duke Mayo Bowl. And let's just start right there, J.C. I mean, how big of a surprise was that performance that uh, South Carolina, I mean, in a blink of an eye, they were up 18-0. to I didn't know they were going to score 18 points in the ball game. How surprised were you that South Carolina was just played so well in that game? Well, I mean, it was it was it was one of those games where you, you looked at it, and you know, when you're looking at North Carolina, uh, Mike, I, I think that sometimes the best defense you can play against those guys is to keep your offense on the field. South Carolina, if you looked at it, dominated time of possession, and they had like 39 minutes in the ball game. Uh, they were able to run the football when South Carolina was able to run the football this season. They were pretty good offense. When they weren't, they were god awful. Uh, so, you know, that was an important part. Uh, I think DeCarrie and Joyner playing quarterback was a uh, a masterful decision by the coaching staff. It was something that, you know, Hel- Helma Granahan from the BigSpur.com and I had gotten word about about two weeks before kickoff, and we were like, eh, this information probably doesn't need to go anywhere, <laughs> you know, right now. <laughs> uh, that would be, you know, and, and I think it they did a good job of keeping it quiet, and they kept North Carolina completely off off balance uh, with that. You know, you had no film on Joyner. Uh, he drops back to throw that first touchdown pass to Jaheim Bell. And, man, what a beautiful throw. I mean, I don't think anybody thought he could throw it like that. And he could. He went nine for nine for 160 yards. Uh, and then the personnel use really got better for Carolina. Bell, uh, number zero, is a guy that kind of came in as a jack of all trades. He's a tight end. He's a running back. He's a wide receiver. Um, was hurt for a lot of the year last year coming off an ACL. But really, when you talk about South Carolina's top weapons, he has been, when given the opportunity, a top weapon. Uh, And you see how they used him. First play of the game, they sweeped him 20 yards rushing. And then the two long passes. And, you know, he was all over the place. And then Kevin Harris, obviously, with his finale as a Gamecock, 31 rushes for 182 yards. That's the Kevin Harris we all saw last season. And I think what people expected this season out of the running backs in the run game in South Carolina, uh, and then the defense, anytime you can hold Sam Howell to three yards rushing against the Tar Heels, uh, as you know, in in North Carolina, I wouldn't say they're limited in the passing game, but they're not like they were last year as far as uh, vertical weapons and all of that. Uh, A lot of their offense came from Howell's ability to improvise with his legs and gain positive yardage in that manner. Boy, the Gamecocks just shut him down. The defensive line dominated. Uh, and, and that's that's to, to beat a team like that, uh, you need great defensive line play. You need to limit the quarterback run opportunities. You need to stay on the field on offense. The Gamecocks dominated in all three of those categories uh, and really dominated the game uh, 38-21. You know, a lot of old-school South Carolina fans were happy because they don't like losing North Carolina. Uh, that goes back to the old ACC days. <laughs> um, and there are not a lot of those guys left, but there's still some out there that boy, they, they'd rather beat North Carolina than anybody else. So certainly 
uh, to cap a seven-win year when nobody expected it with that kind of win over a team you want to beat every time you play them, uh, that's very big. Now, I think the obvious question, the big question there with uh, Gamecock football heading into the offseason, what can you tell us about Marcus Satterfield? Are you anticipating that, uh, you know, maybe he saved his job and he's? Ret- do you think he'll be back for year two under Shane Beamer? Yeah, all signs point to, to him coming back. And, uh, look, let's be honest, it wasn't the greatest year for Marcus Satterfield, even with, you know, some surprising performances like the Florida game and North Carolina game uh, by the offense. You know, it just seemed like when they weren't able to run the ball, they had no answer. Uh, you know, part of that, they're obviously going to point to the quarterback situation. Uh, so all those excuses are going bye-bye next year. You know, South Carolina – uh, has brought in quite a quarterback class with Spencer Rattler out of the portal uh, and then two four-star kids in Tanner Bailey and Braden Davis uh, coming in as freshmen. Uh, plus, you get Luke Doty, who'll be healthy back. So the quarterback room takes a different dynamic. Uh, South Carolina will have more playmakers on that side of the ball, and I think every offensive lineman's coming back as well. So, you know, those excuses are going to be out of the window. Uh, all signs now point to him being retained. Uh, I don't want to say that the bowl game necessarily saved his job, but I think with a bad offensive performance and a loss in that game, uh, it may have been necessary. Um, and, and I'm not sold still. Uh, I'll be honest. I'm, I've, I've had that opinion uh, about the offensive coordinator situation since about game four. And, uh, I'm, I, you know, I'm not changing that. But it's not productive. You know, once the decision's been made, it's not productive for me to sit around and keep hammering it. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens next year because some of these excuses are going out the window uh, as far as, you know, the personnel limitations with this offense. And I, and I think, you know, the one positive thing about Marcus Satterfield is he's not really afraid. You know, he, here's a guy that, uh, to his detriment at times this year, isn't afraid to dial up a trick play or something like that. Um, very creative. I thought the, the game plan against North Carolina was – you know, he had some creative kind of bells and whistles kind of stuff on top of a solid foundation. Uh, I think if he struggles, uh, it's the foundation of it. And I think it's almost like a do too much kind of deal. Uh, the adjustment from pro football to college football, trying to kind of get out of that mindset where there's too much nuance uh, in a pro offense and, and college is more, you know, hey, let's get it and go. Uh, those are the kinds of things he struggled with. So hopefully uh, as we move into 2022, uh, with revamped personnel, better players, a better quarterback room, uh, and a lot of returning guys that are in their second year in the system, uh, hopefully it gets better, you know, and, and we'll see what happens after that. Now, this may be a, an impossible question to answer because we just we never really got to see it, but do you think at all that, uh, you know, the offense we saw in the bowl game, maybe that's kind of what South Carolina was hoping to do with a healthy Luke Doty and a healthy Kevin Harris uh, you know, entering the season, do you think that's a possibility at all? And then, you know, when they suffered their injuries, it's it just kind of just threw a wrench in the whole thing. Well, yes and no. Um, you know, I, I think that obviously Luke going out uh, with the foot injury and then trying to play on it, where he's very limited, hurt their ability to run the ball. Um, you know, there, there's still some things that you look at and kind of head scratching. Uh, you know, Kevin Harris obviously. Uh, was not the same back a lot of the time this season. You know, couldn't really get it going. He's a downhill guy. and You know, the offensive line, you know, took a big step back this season. Uh, really no excuse for that uh, other than they were confused. And then I think that that's uh, when you're confused, you know, I think that uh, that points to coaching, right? Because it's the coach's job to do something your players can learn. Um, but, yeah, I mean, there, there's no question that, like, what they were planning on doing this season – you know, which and and really realistically, what you can do with a Zeb Nolan is a lot different than what you could do with Luke Doty. Uh, I think there's something to call into question. It's uh, you know because people keep talking about the third string quarterback Jason Brown and all that. And yeah, he was third, but you have to ask yourself why. Why was why was this guy not able to go out against Eastern Illinois, uh, a bad FCS team, and have success and get his feet wet and and be the guy? Because if you're going to have blocking problems. You know, Brown at least has that elusiveness uh, to keep his eyes downfield and make plays off schedule in the passing game, which is something they desperately needed. But um, all in all, yeah, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, I think the things they were planning on doing 
uh, with Doty are it, it's kind of similar to what they did with Joiner in the bowl. Um, and I think you can also, after the performance by Joiner, maybe call into question when you compare what he did at receiver this year, which was average, you know, uh, mm-hmm. maybe they should have played Joiner at quarterback. And, and, and not like that's a big old bunch of hot takery there in hindsight by me because I wouldn't have thought it and nobody else would have either. Uh, but boy, Joiner, you know, kind of changed the dynamic of things when he was out there. And, you know, for a team that struggles protecting and, and blocking at times, you know, that's the kind of guy you need. He's helpful because he can squirt out of there and, you know, get yardage. And instead of looking at the stat sheet, you're minus 50 yards rushing. You have 64 on the plus side from him. Uh, and that can make a big difference in a football game. Right, right. So looking back at the first year, you know, the highs and lows, but certainly you got to think that this was a, a massive success year one under Shane Beamer, considering – uh, you know the injuries and and how difficult it is playing in the SEC, and you got Clemson uh, to close out that schedule. What's your overall grade for Shane Beamer? You know what and what kind of stands out from his first season there? I'll give him an A minus because you know the, obviously there was a lot to be desired on offense, and there were problems on that side of the ball. And, and look, the defense this year at South Carolina wasn't perfect; it was massively improved, and they had some games where they looked great. Um, but first year uh, with a program that's accustomed to losing, you know, the last two years, you know, South Carolina was six and 16 uh, the last two years under Muschamp and then Mike Bobo at the end, you know, to turn it around and to get to seven, you know, to win one more game than you did the last two years combined, uh, I think is a massive start, you know, and, and I think w- when you look at it, you know, the Clemson game was a disappointment. Uh, it probably wasn't as dis- disappointing as the loss at Missouri where they only had 250 yards against a terrible defense. Uh, but those two games were disappointing. But, you know, you kind of look at the last five, and three of them were, were good wins, good solid wins. I mean, you know, people say, well, Florida had given up. Uh, and I don't – you know, I don't know. I, I saw that Gator defense play pretty well against Missouri and Florida State and UCF. But – uh Obviously, South Carolina was able to get some things going against them. And, you know, they caught Auburn by surprise. Auburn struggled down the stretch with the exception of Alabama and then the North Carolina thing. Um, but, but it doesn't matter. You know, when you're in that type of situation and you're accustomed to losing, getting wins over those programs who obviously, you know, got an outsized amount of hype compared to the Gamecocks of the offseason, that helps. That helps build your brand. It helps in recruiting. It helps show people that, hey, you're headed in the right direction. Um, you know, you can go into a recruit and say, all right, you know, you like Florida, you like Auburn, you like North Carolina. We beat all those teams this year. And, you know, South Carolina is a program, Mike, uh, interesting stat. Since 2010, this program owns eight wins over uh, the four teams in the playoff. They hadn't played Cincinnati, but they've beaten Alabama. They've beaten Georgia uh, five times, and they've beaten Michigan twice. And, and you know, South Carolina sometimes isn't considered like, oh, you know, kind of an also ran. But, you know, and not all of those were under Spurrier. Muschamp beat Michigan and Georgia. So, you know, this is a program that is capable. And I think that having a winning season, getting it back to that baseline standard, uh, which is seven, seven, six, seven, eight wins in a bowl trip, that's the bait. That's as bad as it should get at South Carolina, uh, was, it was a big, big deal uh, for Beamer as he continues to try to add players, you know, tweak the roster, that kind of thing. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure expectations in 2022 with the guys coming in and the guys returning uh, are going to be a little bit higher. Uh, and so we'll see what he does with it then. Mm-hmm. And how much juice did it bring to the Gamecock program? And, and specifically, I'm talking about the fan base and, and everything you guys got going on at the Big Spur, the go-to site for South Carolina athletics. But, you know, you bring in Spencer Rattler, a guy completed 70% of his passes, 40 touchdowns. He was a legit Heisman contender. And I know things didn't go, you know, the way he wanted at Oklahoma, but you can't judge him off that. You've got to judge, I think, the addition of Spencer Rattler based on what South Carolina had to work with at the quarterback position all last season. Uh, just, you know, how much, uh, you know, Life did that give that program, and 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 how much does that pot- potentially expedite the the building process of, of what Shane Beamer wants the Gamecocks to be? Yeah, I mean, look, Mike, you look around college football. There's a ton of success stories 
that have been written by transfer quarterbacks. Um, I think some of these guys just make decisions based on brand. They don't even look at depth chart because they all think they're great. Then they get there and they're like, oh, my goodness. Now, obviously, that wasn't Rattler's case because he was the starter for a year. And then uh, Caleb Williams just beat him out. I mean, that's just kind of what happened. They were, you know, a better football team with Caleb at quarterback. Uh, but, but what I think this does is it solidifies the room, right? You know, because you, you got question marks. You know, Luke Doty coming off an injury, uh, you know, he's been set back city. You know, thrown into the fire as a freshman, uh, prepared all off season as a starter, broken foot, wasn't at his best. It really got ugly after he re-injured his foot in that Vanderbilt game. Couldn't hit the broad side of a barn. Uh, you know, Zeb Nolan's gone on. He was less than ideal. Uh, you know, so you're really looking at, like, if they didn't have Rattler coming in, you're probably looking at, for real, uh, up the possibility of Jacarian Joyner starting next year. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think what Rattler brings, Mike, is, is just stability. Well, now Luke can take a year, and, and Luke Doty can be the backup. And Luke Doty can kind of take a deep breath and pause. His development won't be rushed. He can get his body healthy. He can learn the system more. He can get it down pat. So we're, if, if, he, if he's in position to do so, he can take over. you got two talented freshmen in T- Tanner Bailey and Braden Davis coming in that help on the backside. But if you didn't have Rattler – it's still a question mark because you're either looking at Joyner or Doty or a true freshman uh, or Colton Goff here, uh, and you just you just don't know if any of those guys are going to be ready. Now this solidifies things. You, you kind of know that there'll be a competition, but you kind of know who your guy is going to be. You can build around it. You can develop behind him. Um, I just think I think it's a, it's a very very big deal uh, for the Gamecocks in terms of you know is it going to lead to a SEC East title? I don't. I wouldn't, I wouldn't predict that, but will it solidify and, and, and add some stability to that position uh, if it's just for a year and let everybody take a deep breath and reset? Uh, I think, yes, it will. So, so it's good for this year, but I think it's also good for the future because you don't have to rush anybody into action. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think the addition that uh, is getting overlooked, and, and it, it's understandable because everyone's getting, you know, five-star quarterback, you get all excited, but I hope I'm saying his name right. Austin Stogner, the the tight end. You know, you you just can't run this pro style type of offense to its to its maximum capability without a really good tight end, and he has been that in for Oklahoma. And and assuming Josh Van returns, Jaheim Bell, he continues to emerge. All of a sudden, South Carolina, who you know, I, I would say the the maybe the biggest weakness receiver options there. Now that's starting to look like a strength there, isn't it? Yeah, I know Stagner was huge because if you look at the tight end room, you know, you have EJ Jenkins who was there, who spent the whole year at receiver, uh, six seven, two hundred forty pound transfer from St. Pat Francis. I think he's got a load of upside. I think the whole question with that guy is, is he really a receiver? I don't think he's an X receiver. I don't think he's an outside receiver. I think he's a uh kind of a flex guy that you can mm-hmm. put in the slot that can make some things happen. Also a very good blocker. So uh, but he was a receiver. The Jaheim Bell, to me, is a receiver. So this, this was some of the personnel use things that you had questions about this year. Um, you know, and they finally started playing him in that manner in the bowl game, and you saw what happened. You know, so there's a vertical threat that can take a top off of defense. He's huge. He's 6'3", 230. I mean, there, you know, Jaheim Bell's a freak, you know. So you start using him well. Um, but, but you needed a tight end because they, they were, the numbers were getting low. Uh, and then Austin Stogner just provides you with a big athletic. I mean, he's like those guys that played at Notre Dame uh, receiver. I mean, sorry, tight end over the years. Just your big six six, some change guy with great hands, but also a, a physical blocker, uh, a guy that can get beat you vertically. Uh, you know, just a, a and already has some some chemistry with Spencer Rattler. So, you know that that was a huge addition, and I, I don't think South Carolina's done with. Uh, receiver or skill position talent in the portal yet either. So that the, they're going to add a couple more pieces. You know, I thought Amari and Brown having the game that he did in the bowl game was huge too. This is a guy that broke Calvin Johnson's touchdown record as a true freshman at Georgia Tech. Uh, kind of had to find his way this year. Again, another personnel use uh, question there. Uh, but they got him some vertical balls, and he, he made a guy miss and, and had a nice red four catches for 61 yards. So at the slot position, you know, there's a guy that, hey, the light may have come on. 
Um, and you mentioned Van and those other guys. So, you know, that, that's one of the big things with Rattler. You, you're going to have to have some guys around him catching passes. And I think the Gamecocks have moved toward that a bit and also will continue to move more toward it as they work the portal uh, here uh, down for the rest of uh, however long the recruiting period gets. Now, by my account, I think South Carolina's got five guys that are super seniors poised to return uh, for Shane Beamer year two. I think that's a terrific sign. I, I think we saw that from Ole Miss and Arkansas, and, that, and I think that's why they had such big seasons in, in year two under those respective coaches. And considering all the massive changes there at Clemson and them not having a, an elite quarterback, they came a little bit down to earth. Do you think there's a window there right now? You know, I don't think it's fair to say you can make up the ground and be, you know, surpass Clemson necessarily uh, immediately, but it's starting to seem like that that rivalry is shifting a little bit. Do you think that that's true? And do you think the Gamecocks can take advantage of uh, all the turmoil there at, at Clemson? Well, I, I think. Yeah, you know, it's hard because the two programs, are, you know, obviously they're both in the state of South Carolina. And, you know, this year in particular in recruiting in the state, you know, there are certain things if you're Clemson you should always be able to do. And number one, that's sign guys out of Greenville County. Uh, and two of the top guys in the state were from Greenville County. And number two, you should be able to sign just about any receiver you want, especially from in-state and the other two guys are receivers. Uh, and, and so that – you know, recruiting wise, they don't really go after the same players a whole lot. You know, it, it may be that that ends up happening now uh, in this new era we're in, but uh, they don't go head to head. Um, it, it's a it's a different ball game. I, I think that for South Carolina uh, to really start to say, okay, we're going to get on equal footing with Clemson. You know, they have to start being competitive in the football game. I mean, it, 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 it's almost. What would concern me if I were, you know, just looking at it from a Gamecocks perspective is, and I remember this a few years ago, Virginia Tech goes up to Charlottesville, and uh, everybody's talking about this is the, the time Virginia will snap the streak, and there was a lot on the line. I think there was an ACC Coastal title on the line, and, and Tech goes in there and beats them 38 nothing badly. <laughs> I think Shane was on that staff. Uh and that's kind of what happened to the Gamecocks in that game this year. People were like, well, they should be able to at least compete, and they didn't. Uh, and it's been that way, you know, since 2015 when it was a five-point game. There was one offensive outburst by Jake Bentley at Death Valley one year, and it was still a 21-point loss. So South Carolina needs to do it on the field uh, against those guys. But as we all know, Mike, it, it sort of starts with recruiting and starts with you know, getting good coaches in and building your program. Dabo didn't build that thing overnight up there, and uh, it'll take Beamer a little bit to get it going at South Carolina. But, you know, you, you certainly like your chances uh, to kind of get on that footing if you're the Gamecocks with all the changes at Clemson uh, than you would have had they just kept on keeping on and Venables and Elliott are still there and everybody Bates is still there. And they're just, uh, they're just, ah, oh, we had a down year at 10 and 3. And, they're going to be back in the playoff next year. Now, they could be back in the playoff next year. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but you like your chances a little better, uh, the more instability they have. Uh, but like I said, it, it, it's going to, you know, to, to get that rivalry back, you know, it's going to take better performances on the field. And uh, unfortunately, it was just disappointing uh, this year. I, I, I firmly believe the South Carolina Clemson game should have gone a little bit more like Iowa State and Clemson. Uh, than, than what happened, um, and uh, and it didn't. So that that that's that's the next task, and you know you, you still got eleven games <laughs> next year before you got to worry about it. Uh, but I think that's kind of the next step uh, for them to take is they got they got to start being competitive in, in that football game. And I mentioned some teams they had beaten uh, since 2010, and uh, you know there's four wins over Clemson that are in there too. Uh, but, mm -hmm. you know, hey, in recent years, the Gamecocks have beaten Georgia and they've beaten Michigan and they've beaten Florida uh, twice and, and all that. But they, they they have not been able to to scratch uh, or to sniff a win over their arch rival. And I think that's the next step. Uh, it's a it's a very much on the field thing. And I'm, I'm concerned that it's, it's more mental after what happened this year when, uh, for all intents and purposes, South Carolina should have had a better night defensively and uh, maybe scratch out a touchdown or so on offense. All right, JC, I really appreciate all your time. Just one more thing for you. 
Who do you like in the national championship we got up here? Alabama, Georgia, and all SEC final once again. Who's taking home the crown this year? Wow, it's, it's going to be it's so hard to beat a team twice uh, mm-hmm. in college football. As we all know, I mean, the last time I think this happened was Alabama LSU in 2011. But, uh, look, I, um, I, uh, I told somebody the other day, you know, they're like, oh, you're going to pick Georgia because I picked Georgia in the SEC game and I got burnt. And they're like, you're, you're going to pick Georgia again, blah, blah. And I'm like, nah, nah I'm just going to roll with the tide. It's one of those things where I'm going to pick Bama until there's a reason not to. And uh, I'm curious to see what adjustments Georgia's made on defense. I think Georgia uh, obviously went back to being the dominant football team when they played Michigan. But Michigan's not Bama. And uh, Alabama has made a living out of these situations, the times when they're the underdog. You know, they'll show up and beat you and, and be prepared. So, you know, we'll find out what happens. I, you know, obviously, I thought Georgia was more impressive relative to competition with Bama and the semis. But, hey, Georgia was more impressive against Georgia Tech than, than Bama was escaping Auburn. And we saw what happened in that game, too. So, I don't know if that tells you much. So, I'm, I'm picking the Crimson Tide. Uh, you know, I, I could see it going either way. But just because of a promise I made uh, to my buddy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with Alabama. All right, he's J.C. Sherbert, owner of the Big Spur. Follow him at J.C. Sherbert. And don't forget to check out the Inside the Gamecocks podcast and the J.C. and Morgan College Football Podcast. He went on an epic rant against all these damn people calling out college football for this bowl system. That, that's worth a listen alone. But uh, I appreciate you, J.C. I really do. Hey, thanks, Mike. And a happy new year to you guys. And uh, certainly enjoy your work. And looking forward to the next time we get together. All right, so just want to say thanks again to J.C. for hopping on the line, going on this deep dive. is very gracious with his time here, so I uh, really appreciate that. They do an outstanding job over at TheBigSpur.com, part of the uh, 24-7 Sports Network. That's the go-to site for South Carolina football, basketball, and uh, just about it. Women's basketball, I mean, hell, they cover it all over there. So I really appreciate him hopping on the line and inside the Gamecocks with uh, that and uh, – Keith Allsap's Locked On Gamecocks podcast. Those are my two South Carolina Gamecock podcasts. So you got to check them out as well. But, hey, that's going to do it for this episode of the show. Appreciate each and every one of you for hanging out, and we'll catch you on the next one.